The Supreme Court agreed Monday to hear the case of Lee Malvo more than 15 years after he was convicted in the Beltway sniper shootings. He was a juvenile when he was sentenced to life without parole. Malvo terrorized the Washington, D.C. area in 2002 with his older accomplice, John Allen Muhammad. The pair killed 10 people and wounded others during a two-month sniper shooting spree. At the time, Malvo was 17 years old. A court ruled he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. But since then, the Supreme Court has changed the rules for sentencing minors to life. Meanwhile, Muhammad was sentenced to death and executed for the crimes in 2009. Malvo was found guilty of capital murder in 2003. Here's Cheryl Atkinson's report from the CBS Evening News that night. Families of the victims solemnly filed out of court after the three guilty verdicts, two for capital murder and a firearms charge. The only one who spoke publicly after the verdicts was the brother of yes, Dean Myers, victim number seven out of ten, shot at a gas station in Virginia. We are extremely pleased with the verdict, believe that justice has been served, and we appreciate the opportunity now to move into the sentencing phase. The jury apparently took Lee Malvo at his word, at least when he admitted right after his arrest that he was the trigger man in the murder of Linda Franklin. The jury rejected the defense argument that Malvo was himself the last victim in the shootings, brainwashed by sniper mastermind John Mohammed, his father figure. Malvo's lawyer had even called Malvo John Mohammed Jr. Both sides are still bound by the judge's gag order and can't talk to the media. Prosecutor Robert Horan. We aren't allowed to comment. Horan used closing arguments to show the jury gruesome photos of Franklin after she was shot. That's this defendant's handiwork, he told them. That's what he did. Joining me now from Falls Church, Virginia, is Ilya Shapiro. Ilya is the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. Thanks so much for being with us, Ilya. Malvo and Mohammed committed what Virginia officials have called, quote, one of the most notorious strings of terrorist acts in modern American history. So why would the Supreme Court decide to hear Malvo's case now? Malvo was 17 when he committed his murders, uh, and the Supreme Court decided in 2012 that uh, minors, those under 18, cannot be sentenced to a mandatory life without parole. And then in 2016, the court decided that that rule applied retroactively. Well, Malvo's sentence was not a mandatory life without parole. It was discretionary. The jury uh, could decide, and, and that's what it decided. So the question now before the court is there's a split on this issue among courts across the country uh, about whether that earlier rule applies to these discretionary uh, sentences of life without parole. Well, do we know if the Supreme Court had any reservations about taking this case? If so, what might have contributed to that? It's a really unusual process. We don't know exactly what the justices were thinking, that, that those discussions aren't public. Uh, but the case, uh, once the petition from Malvo's lawyers came in last fall, was relisted, meaning that they were going to be taking it up in conference again and again and again, nine times. That's really unusual, which means who knows what their discussions were behind the scenes, thinking about whether this is an important enough case to take. Uh, whether the underlying factual uh, history makes us too unusual to set the rule for the entire country. Well, we'll have to see this fall when they have argument in the case. Yeah, the case will be heard in October of this year. What are the central legal issues that we should be paying attention to when each side makes their argument? So the, the question is this, uh, they're very technical things. Again, uh, the initial Supreme Court ruling in 2012 says you cannot have mandatory life without parole. Uh, for juveniles, let alone the death penalty. That was gotten rid of uh, even earlier. And then four years later, they made that rule retroactive. But here in Virginia, this was not a mandatory life without parole. It's something that the jury was given the option to do, and uh, and they applied that. So did they use the correct standards? Is the uh, Does the uh, prohibition of, of the court from 2012 against mandatory life without parole, does that extend to even the option of having life uh, without parole? Those are the technical criminal procedure questions, sentencing issues that the court will be uh, wrestling with. Yeah, any idea what the likely outcome might be? Well, uh, it depends if this is, if the court treats this as a normal 
uh, sentencing death penalty or juvenile justice case, then those ty types of cases have tended to be five to four liberals versus conservatives with Justice Kennedy in the middle. Of course, now Justice Kennedy is no longer on the court. He retired. Brett Kavanaugh has replaced him. Kavanaugh doesn't have a record on, on the death penalty. You don't get that in the in the D.C. circuit, so we don't really know. Or if the court treats this as a kind of technical crim criminal procedure case, then, uh, you know, anything could happen. And John Roberts, certainly the chief justice, wants to avoid, this is his project, having the court look like it's making political or partisan decisions. All right, Ilya Shapiro. Ilya, thanks very much. My pleasure.